Sorry, I got my whole setup here. Thanks a minute. How is everyone today? I am uh, very happy to be back. Um, and, but before I get started, I just want to take a moment and uh, thank, uh, they're probably not watching, but I thank our uh, guest speakers we had the last few weeks. And I, I thank you all for uh, being gracious with them. I know that I was hired, but they, they were scheduled long before uh, I was even, you know, on the radar. But uh, what that allowed me to do is uh, that allowed me to take the time. I would have been writing sermons to go spend that with you all. And uh, you guys made me fatter than I already am. Like I ate a lot of meals with you all over those few weeks. And I just uh, thank you all for your hospitality. And I'm just really glad that we were able to uh, get to know that you all better. But now that December is finally here, we can finally celebrate Christmas, right? Um, now, it's a divisive issue what I'm about to say. But if you were someone that put your Christmas decorations up before Thanksgiving, then I say shame on you. That's way too early. You know, there's no place for that, you know. But we can still love each other here, you know. I, I forgive you. But now we can officially celebrate Christmas. And it's finally time to sort of get in the season. And I have so many childhood memories that revolve around Christmas, just like I'm sure that you all do. But if there's one thing that I can remember from year to year, and it's a funny little story, and I think many of you probably had a similar childhood, and uh, our kids in there are going to have the same thing, is, is that as I remember always trying to go to sleep, on Christmas Eve, I would go to bed early, right? Because my parents were sick and tired of me. They sent me to bed, but I couldn't sleep. And so I'd be up, you know, till like 10 or 11 or 12. And I remember there'd be many nights, many Christmas Eves, where I wouldn't go to sleep until like two in the morning. And then what happens? I wake up at like three and then immediately go wake the parents up and say, it's Christmas, right? Come and get up. Like you're not doing your job. You told me to go to sleep. And when I wake up, it'd be Christmas. And I'm sure that they were greatly annoyed. But do you know why I was so excited? It was because for the last month or two, my parents, like once a day, sat me down and said, hey, Chris, just so you know, here's a catalog. Make a Christmas list. You know, if, if, if you're lucky, you're going to get some of these Christmas gifts, right? My parents had built up this idea for me. And so really, it was their fault that I was waking them up in the middle of the night, right? Because they had been telling me that on Christmas morning, I might be able to get some of these gifts. But there was a little bit of a deal, too, right? It wasn't just... They weren't just going to do it, or at least, well, they were. But as a kid, they don't tell you that they're just going to do it anyway. What do they say? They say, you got to stay on the nice list, right? You can't get on the naughty list, or you might not get anything, or you might get a lump of coal or something else. That was our little Christmas agreement between child and parent, right? That was our little, for lack of better words, it gets into this, our little Christmas covenant. My parents said that we're going to get you something, may not be everything you want to, but we're going to get you gifts. But you have to stay on the nice list. You can't get on that naughty list or else we don't know what's going to happen. So as we get closer and closer to Christmas Day, I'm excited to go through this little series. Uh, this little series that I'm calling The Covenant. Because Christmas time really is about God making true on his promise. God making true to give us the fulfillment of his most important covenant in scripture. And so we're going to go over this series over the next four weeks. And uh, this week we're going to talk about our need for a savior. Next week we're going to talk about the blood of the lamb. Two weeks from now we're going to talk about the throne of God. And then finally on Christmas Eve we're going to talk about the birth of Emmanuel. And I'm excited to lead us through this. Let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending us all here safely this morning. And I'm so thankful to be so, see so many people here that want to be in your house, that want to experience you and come to see you this morning. I just pray that as we get ready to go through this message that these are not my words, but they're just yours, and that I'm just a vessel that you use to say what you want to say. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before we get into this, let's go ahead and just lay it out. What exactly is a covenant, okay? So covenant is sort of a churchy word, and it's kind of a legal word. What is a covenant? From a legal perspective, a covenant is just an agreement between two parties, it usually involves a task or some sort of responsibility that each one of the two parties has to one another. You know, for example, the first one that I came up with when I was looking for examples was like a sports contract. And uh, I'm not necessarily a Bengals fan. I'm not anti-Bengals. But I know that they just signed a new contract with Joe Burrow, a five-year extension for $275 million this year. That's a pretty good gig. Right, but their little covenant is that Joe Burrow is going to play quarterback and he's going to do his best and hopefully not get injured and the Bengals are going to pay him a lot of money. That's their little covenant, their little agreement. But from a theological perspective, from a biblical perspective, 
A covenant is an agreement or a promise between God and his people. And a lot of times, even though God demands and requires certain things of us, God is also very gracious. And so sometimes covenants are just God's gracious gift to us. There's numerous covenants in scripture. You could, you could Google it. You could find a lot of examples of biblical covenants. You can get the Mosaic covenant, uh, all sorts of different ones. But there's one serious covenant that sort of sets the tone for this time of year and that really everything else in the Bible is truly about. Everything in Scripture, everything in the Bible, all is about this one covenant. And that is that God has promised to bring mankind back into fellowship with him. That's the original covenant. And actually Gary's uh, offering meditation went so well with this, and he didn't even know it, because God desires fellowship with us. And when we stepped away from that, I believe that God's heart was broken. And so he had made an agreement to bring us back into fellowship with him, or at least to clearly lay out a way that we can return to him. But we broke it, right? We broke that original fellowship with our sin. And that separation, that divide from our creator, all came into the world back in Genesis. And so we're going to start at the beginning today. We're not going to start in Luke chapter 1, you know, the great Christmas uh, passage in time, but we're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. So if you have a Bible, feel free to open it up to the book of Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to read some select passages out of chapters 2 and chapter 3, and we're going to take a look at just where our need for this covenant came from. Because truth be told, when Adam and Eve were here originally, before they had really messed things up, there was not a need for God to make a covenant with us because we were already living in fellowship with him. But we're going to begin reading um, in verse, or chapter 2, beginning verse 15. And then after a little bit, we'll jump to chapter 3. Verse 15. The Lord, took, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now let's skip to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you to not eat from? And the man said, the woman you gave me, you put me here with, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then the woman said, it was the serpent. It deceived me, and I ate it. You know, things were so perfect for Adam and Eve, weren't they? Like, we, we fantasize all the time about how wonderful and how perfect the Garden of Eden must have been. You know, if, if you're an honest person, you would say that, yeah, I thought how awesome and how wonderful it would be if sin never entered the world and we could live in unity with God. But when I, it comes down to it, I think one of the reasons that they had it so well off, it, it's not just because, um, you know, it was just those two, and it's not just because of other reasons. The real reason they had it so well off is because they had the answer to the greatest question that mankind has ever asked. And that is, what is my purpose? Why am I here? That's the question that every philosopher and every human pretty much has struggled with at some point in their life is, why am I here? What exactly am I supposed to be doing? What is my purpose? You see, Adam and Eve had the answer to that question. And that answer is, their purpose, the reason for their entire existence, 
was to be in fellowship with God and to live for the glorification of God. And a little hint, that's our purpose too. That's why we were made. And they had that. They were able to fellowship with God. And we saw that in verse 8, that they walked with the Lord. The Lord was there looking for fellowship with his creation. And it was through their responsibility of caring for the Garden of Eden that they were able to bring glory to God, further fulfilling their entire purpose. They had everything. They had the answer and the solution to life's greatest mystery, life's greatest problem, which is, what is my purpose? They didn't just know it. They were able to live it out. But for some reason, they were so easily convinced to abandon that purpose and that fulfillment, right? It was not super difficult for the serpent to trick them into sin. It was not so difficult to get them to give up on that purpose. You know, I, I think a lot of times we make a similar mistake. You know, we can have things going so well in life. Things are going so good. We're growing as a person. We have a wonderful, beautiful family, a wonderful job. But all of a sudden, we get tempted by something so stupid and so mundane and so pointless, and we give it all up, don't we? So let's not judge her too harshly. But then again, it was a bad trade, a bad deal. In the end, I think what the serpent, which was Satan, what he was able to get Eve to do was this. He was able to have her give up the worship of her creator and instead worship the created. And really, this is a, a good working definition of sin. Okay, and I want us to keep this in mind because today, in order for us to understand the importance of God's covenant, in order for us to understand why the birth of Jesus is so significant and why it matters to each one of us personally, we have to understand a little bit about sin. And so while we are getting into Christmas, if we want to do the birth of Jesus and its meaning and injustice, we have to talk a little bit about sin. Sin basically is when we worship the created instead of the creator. It's whenever we seek pleasure from what is created, not who created it. It's when we try to find our meaning in what's in the world, not who made the world. It's when we seek to replace the fulfillment offered by God for the temporary pleasure offered somewhere else. And immediately upon choosing this sin, what happened to Adam and Eve? They immediately regretted their decision. They knew that they messed up immediately, right? They immediately saw how bad that deal was. Because we see in Scripture that they immediately became afraid, they immediately felt shame, and they went and they hid. And what I think is a really interesting little point to, uh, to sin here, and something that we don't talk about a lot, is by them hiding in the trees and the bushes, they, they actually started to pervert nature. And what I mean by that was up until this point, Adam and Eve, their job was to control and to take care of nature. And to have it glorify God. And immediately after just one sin, the purpose of nature for them was no longer to be used to glorify God, but was now to cover their own sin and shame and nakedness. They perverted God's creation immediately upon their sin. I believe, though, that Adam and Eve didn't really know how severe the consequences of their sin were. I believe that God told them. Well, we know that God told them. But I don't think they really understood how terrible and how awful this sin was going to be. You know, it reminds me, I, I, uh, I used to hunt a little bit. Not much. I'm not a, a big hunter by any stretch of the imagination. But um, a few years ago, I set up a little deer stand in a, um, my wife's grandfather's farm. And I put it there, and, and I, I left it for a couple months before I came back for deer season. And I remember I spent many mornings, you know, before the sun came out, sitting up in the deer stand. And, you know, when, it, when I gave up, I would get down, and I would just leave in a hurry. And I remember after about a week, after about a week of doing this, you know, I, I got all these rashes on my arm and I couldn't figure it out. And, you know, finally I was out there one afternoon and it was bright and I saw that the entire area underneath me and all up the tree was just a ton of poison ivy, right? That's what sin is like in our life. We don't see how pervasive and how much sin chokes every part of us out. I was up there just having a great old hoot and hollering time, you know, just trying to hunt and, you know, not having any luck, but enjoying being by myself. I was covered in all this poison ivy and I had to go get shots and everything. It was awful. That's what sin is like for us. We think that we're on top of the world. We think we're having a great time. Little do we know 
that we're surrounded by this toxic filth that is going to rot us away. So very briefly this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the nature of sin. There's five different aspects of sin that I want to talk about because I don't think we all understand exactly how bad sin affects us. And when I say we're going to talk about sin, I'm not, we're not going to talk about the consequences of sin. We know that it's hell. We know that's what we deserve. We're not going to get into that sort of stuff. But we're going to talk about what it really does to us and how it affects us and how we choose that thing. Because I believe that if we go through this, then we're going to leave and we're going to get on the other side and we're going to have a better appreciation, a better understanding of just how significant the birth of Jesus Christ really is. The first thing about sin that I want you to know is that sin is active. Okay? And when I say that sin is active, what I mean is that sin is an action of our body or of our mind. Sin is not something that you or I passively do. We do not passively sin. Sin is whenever we actually choose to do something that is contrary to God's will. It's, I, I think of it this way, it's a lot like playing football. You, know, you don't accidentally wake up one day with, with a helmet and shoulder pads on getting ready to receive a punt, right? You don't do that accidentally. Whenever we sin, you know, we step off that cliff willingly at some point. We don't accidentally stumble into it to start with. Something, that's something we participate in. And we do it with some level of understanding, too. And that's why one reason that children are innocent until they reach what we would call like an age of understanding is because sin is something that we understand that we know that we are doing. You know, whenever we lie, we are doing that with our words. It's an action. Whenever we lust, we are doing that with our mind. It is something that we do. Whenever we are gluttonous, we do it with our body. Whenever we are prideful, we do it with just about all of us, right? Whenever we sin, whatever it is, it is something that you make the choice to do. Now, I understand that the more we sin, the more numb we become to it, so we don't always notice it, but it is something that we choose to do. So whenever you sin, you are making an active choice to pursue the perversion of the created, not the creator. It's an important point, is we knowingly and willingly give up on who made the universe, who made us, on God himself, in order to pursue what he created. The second thing that we need to know briefly about sin this morning is that there is a significant relational effect when it comes to sin. You know, as we've already pointed out, sin is whenever we forsake our relationship with God and replace him with something else. We estrange ourselves from God whenever we choose to sin. But God and our relationship with him is not the only relationship that is affected whenever we choose sin. When we choose sin, it is going to affect and it's going to deteriorate every healthy relationship in our lives. You cannot choose to sin without it affecting every single healthy relationship that you have. You may not see it, and you may not know it at first, but it is going to affect and it's going to work at the destruction of every good relationship that you have. I don't care what it is. There's not one sin that you could come up with that isn't going to work at pulling you away from God, obviously, but also others and people that you care for. Sin always pushes away God, and sin always pushes away others. Do you remember what Adam said to God in verse 12 whenever God came to him and asked him about the fruit? <laughs> Immediately, his, his perf up until that point, his perfect wife, he immediately turned on her, didn't he? And he said, it was this woman, this, this woman that you gave me, she made me sin. They were one sin deep, and, and the relationship was already had a huge crack in it, didn't it? Adam immediately forsook his relationship with Eve to try and throw her under the bus because he knew he got caught. And another great example of this comes from Luke 15, 21, the story of the prodigal son. After going through all of his sinnings and all of his running around, it says, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Whenever you choose to sin, whenever you make that choice every day, which, by the way, I'm sure I've already sinned today, right? Not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Whenever we do that, we choose to push others away. We push God away, we push our spouse away, we push our children away, 
We push our friends and our family away and our coworkers and everyone, and we give it up for that bit of pleasure. And it's just a shame because usually whenever we're in that moment, whenever we're being tempted, we, we never see it and we never recognize it until it's too late, right? We don't see the effect of our sin and our evil until it's usually too late. It's important that you know the relational effect that sin has on your life and the lives of others around you. Yeah, a third aspect of the nature of sin is that we can understand sin a lot legally. There's a big legal aspect to sin. And here's what I mean by this. 1 John 3, 4 says that everyone who breaks the law, or everyone who sins breaks the law, in fact, sin is lawlessness. This means for us that sin is not subjective, sin is objective. God has a clear, set standard And that is his standard, right? There is no different standard of God's law for the poor or the rich, the successful or unsuccessful, or anyone else. God has a set standard. You know, I don't really care who you are, and this is is my stance. I think it's supported by Scripture. What is a sin for you is a sin for me, and what is a sin for us is a sin for anyone else outside of this room. And as far as I can tell, there's no exceptions. The only thing that comes close to an exception in Scripture is whenever it tells us in James that teachers are going to be judged more strictly. But it doesn't say that we sin more. It just says that we're judged against that more harshly, more strictly. You know, I, I, uh, I, I thought of this example. I remember I was like 17 years old, and uh, I had a car. I had no business having a car at that age, but I had a car. And I had a cell phone. I also had no business having a cell phone at that age, but I had a cell phone. And I remember I got a telemarketing call. And th- this was before telemarketers were as big a deal as they are now. And I pick it up, and it was a real person, and uh, it, they said, hello, um, we're looking for William, that's my real name, by the way. They said, we are from the Fraternal Order of Police. They said, for, uh, for $25 a year, we'll send you a sticker, and you can put it on your car. And I, I probably didn't even have but $30 to my name, but I said, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'll do that for you guys. I got that bumper sticker in the mail, and I put it on my car. I had a convertible Mustang. And you know what I thought? I, I kid you not, what went through my mind is I said, you know, if I have this police uh, bumper sticker in my car, I'm not going to get a ticket if I get pulled over, right? <laughs> that's what I thought. I promise, that's what I thought. It didn't work. <laughs> Maybe it works for some of you. It didn't work for me, right? But a lot of times we think that there's a different standard for certain people. We think that because of my status, my accomplishments, or because I already spend a lot of time in the church helping or because I already spend time feeding others, then I have more leniency with God's will or God's law. It's not the case. God has an objective law, an objective standard that we all have to fit around. The fourth thing that you need to know about sin is that sin is personal. You own the responsibility of your sin. I don't own your sin and you don't owe my sin. We own that ourselves. Adam tried to dodge the responsibility of his sin, and it didn't work, did it? <laughs> like, he, he even tried to say that my sin, like Eve, and then Eve tried to say the serpent. It didn't work, did it? God knew that they made that act of choice. So this means a couple of things for you here today, and I want some of you all to hear me this, because I know, I know that some of you are struggling with this, okay? This means that you are not guilty of the sins that others have committed, Okay? You are not guilty of the sins that other people have committed. You are not guilty of the sins committed by your parents. You are not guilty of the sins committed by your children. You are not guilty of the sins committed by your spouse or anyone else. On the flip side, they are not guilty of the sins that you have committed. I I, I try to live a, a moral and upright life, but I still struggle with, you know, the effect that, you know, my mistakes and my sins have on my family. And absolutely, there's consequences. I'm not saying there's no consequences in this world where it sins, but the guilt, that eternal and spiritual guilt, is only owned by the person who does it. You are not guilty because your parents or your spouse has sinned, and they are not guilty because you have sinned. Okay? There's no one that can take away the responsibility of your sin, except Jesus Christ. And fifthly, 
our last aspect of the nature of sin is that you've got to understand that sin is very psychological too. There's a big psychological component to sin. Because I, I believe, and I, I think Scripture would back this up, sin sort of comes from our unchecked desires and pleasures. Now, God gave us innate desires and pleasures that are good, right? God gave us appetites. God gave us things that are good. And God gave us blessings and way to fulfill those desires. Sin occurs whenever we indulge in that appetite or indulge in that desire too far, right? The easiest example, of course, right, is man and woman's sexual desire for one another. God gave a really clear solution to that problem, right? Biblical marriage between a man and a woman. Sin occurs when that appetite is indulged upon outside of those parameters. Sin happens whenever we don't check ourselves mentally and whenever we allow ourselves to get out of control. And there's also something really tragic that happens whenever we sin too, right? We become addicted to it. Sin is super addictive. It's more addictive than any, you know, tobacco. It's more addictive than any alcohol. It's more addictive than any drug out there. Sin is addictive. We become a slave to that sin in the words of Paul. And we just have a hard time escaping it, don't we? Because everywhere where we go, we end up being tempted by that sin. If you, uh, if you fall into some sort of world of sin, into some sort of issue, you have problems driving even to the grocery store without being tempted by it, don't you? Doesn't matter what it is. There's a huge psychological component to sin because we become a slave to it. So at this point in the sermon, you may be asking, Chris, I thought you were doing a Christmas sermon. Why are we talking so much about sin? And I've already told you in brief, but why are we going through this at Christmas time? And the answer is really simple. It's because I, Chris Hopkins, need Jesus Christ. You all desperately need Jesus Christ as well. If we don't come face to face with the reality that we need a Savior, that we need someone that can take on the penalty of our sin, then we are out of luck. We are up a creek without a paddle. We have no hope. Thank God that he sent Jesus Christ. And thank God for that crucifixion and that resurrection too. Because every person out there, something I've said, something that God has whispered to you in your ear through the Spirit this morning, you know that you have sins in your life that you can't escape. You see the effects of sin in your life. You know that we're in a bad spot. And you know that you need someone to help you. Jesus Christ is that help. He is the answer to this covenant. The reality that Adam and Eve stepped into, the reality that Adam and Eve brought us into, is a world that is entangled with sin at every single level. They gave up everything for nothing. But we have something to be thankful this morning. Thank God that God doesn't give up on us as easily as Adam and Eve gave up on him. And thank God that he isn't going to give up on you and I, just like we do with him every single day. There are two parts to God's response to this sin where we see the covenant come into place. That the first comes from Genesis 3.15. In his response to the sin, in his curse of the serpent, God says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his wheel, his heel. In other words, in the, the Chris standard version, this is what he said. He said, one day I am going to send someone that is going to destroy you once and for all, Satan. You are going to strike his heel, but he is going to strike you down. You may win a battle, but you are not going to win the war. You will perish and I am going to strike down all sin with you. And I am going to bring my people back into fellowship with me. That was this original covenant, this original promise from God. Immediately after the first sin, immediately after God's greatest creation, and God's prized creation too, by the way, imagine the hurtness that God was caught. He created Adam and Eve to fellowship with him. He wanted them way more than they could have ever wanted him. He was hurt. Immediately he comes and says, you are not going to take this so easily. Right here, God promises the world that he is going to send a savior. God's covenant is that someone is going to come and strike down Satan and 
rid the world of evil for good. But the second thing, in order for this perfect grace to come upon his creation, there's a cost, right? There's a cost. Going down to verse 21, we get a foreshadowing of what's to come. In response to their nakedness and their shame, God did this out of grace. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Adam and Eve were naked, they were afraid, and they were shamed, and they had separated themselves totally from God. But God, out of his compassion, provided for them, even though they no longer deserved it. God provided for them, even though they just chose, just a few moments ago, to abandon him. But in order for God to provide this for them, in order for God to try and repair the relationship, to come back into fellowship with them, blood had to be shed, right? See, if you look up the word in Hebrew, whenever it says God took the skin of an animal, it's, it's not the word for fleece. It's not the word for feathers or hair. It means leather. It means skin. Blood had to be shed in order for God to bridge that gap back with his creation. And he was willing to take that upon his own hands out of his love for us. And church, that is why Jesus Christ came. He came to be that perfect sacrifice. He came to have his own skin ripped to shreds on the cross for us. We do not deserve him. We do not deserve to be covered by his blood. In fact, our own sin, even to this day, is what caused it. But he loves you so much and he loves you so badly that he was willing to anyway. And so as we get ready to close, the question I have for you is, do you wish to continue to indulge in sin? I, I think on the one hand, we're never going to be able to totally escape sin because we're fallen and we're messed up. But do you want to continue to indulge in sin and turn a blind eye to this promise from God? Do you want to continue to ignore that sacrifice and the cost that God has already paid for you? Or do you want to run to him, ask forgiveness, take his grace, and live a new life? You know, the good news is that for a lot of us, we've already accepted God and we've already been baptized and our sins have been paid for. And we have the hard, almost impossible task of fighting sin every single day because we, we don't want to keep ripping that relationship apart. We don't want to rip that relationship apart any faster than God can try to bridge it, right? So we've got to fight that battle with sin. But I know there's some of us that have never actually taken that step. Right? And the gospel message for you this morning is that even though that you've sinned, even though that you have actively chosen to go against what God wants, he sees that and he knows it and he offers you new life anyway. He offers to cover you with his blood anyway. I don't know what kind of Christmas gift, what kind of promise could be any better than that. Right? You know, just like how when I was a kid waking up on Christmas morning, maybe I wasn't always nice. I probably deserved to be on the naughty list, but out of my parents' benevolent love, they still got me something. God is here. He's ready and he wants you. You need to make that decision for him. If that's something that you would like to do, I, I invite you this morning as we get ready to sing to come forward. Let's pray very quickly before we sing. Grace, tell me, Father, I thank you so much for your son. We have no way of escaping the damnation that our own sins have brought us other than you, Jesus. And I pray that if there's anyone here that needs to get right with you, I pray that you move on their heart and that you will motivate them to make that decision. And Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that you, that you give us the strength that we need to keep fighting that battle, to turn our life around, to leave sin behind as much as possible in order to be back in fellowship with you. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.